All right, so here we go with our one of our first case studies for this class. Uh, we're going to present hydrocephalosis. Wei Ling, Alan, myself, and Susanna for this class. And if we could get the next slide here, the etiology and risk factors. Many uh, risk factors. Uh, hydrocephalosis is increased fluid in the cerebral ventricles or subarachnoid space. According to our understanding pathophysiology book here, uh, Puther and the other authors, they believe it can be a communicating type or a lap of absorption of cerebral spinal fluid to subarachnoid space. And it can be created by tumors compressing on the subarachnoid space. It could also be head injuries, high venous pressure and sagittal space, more common in adults than it is in children. You're not gonna see this too often in children. So there is a colleague Susanna created there. Uh, we have a little diagram that shows the circulation of the cerebral fl spinal fluid uh, building up down there, causing the pressure in the cerebral spinal fluid on the subarachnoid space, causing the hydrocephalus. We get the next slide there. Etiology and risk factors continued. There are non-communicating types and communicating types of these risk factors. The non-communicating types are more common in children. It could be cerebral spinal fluid is obstructed between the ventricles. Could be congenital abnormality. Um, Adduct stenosis rare before birth. According to Huther and authors there, the congenital type is one to three per 1,000 births. So um, the way I came up with this math is I divided one divided by the 1,000 births, came out to 0.1% to 3.3%. Three, three, three divided by 1,000 is 0.3%. So not very common. According to Duwin and authors, they say it affects more than 380,000 people annually. That's worldwide. More common, you're going to see it more in Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia. Not so common in the United States or Canada. Very few cases there. Um, no exact statistics, however, they just say it's less common. Um, differential diagnosis were many which surprised me. Um, therefore, we have to use our acute nursing judgment and rely on the other CT scans, MRIs, whatnot, um, we'll talk about later. According to Nelson and their article, there's there's several, including acute subdermal hematoma, childhood migrant variants, migraine variants, epidermal hematoma, frontal lobe epilepsy, frontal temporal dementia, glioblastoma metaforme. And if that's not enough for you, there's a few more here. Intracranial hemorrhage, migraine headaches, pituitary tumors, sudden vision loss, and primary central nervous system lymphomas, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd like to have, pass it off to my classmate Wei Ling for the pathophysiology here. Okay, hi. Here's the pathophysiology and hydrocephalus. Um, it is the buildup of fluid in the ventricles deep within the brain. Uh, the excess fluid increases the size of the ventricles and puts pressure on the brain. I see as F normally flows through the ventricles and the that is the brain and the spinal column but the pressure of the too much CSF associated with the hydrocephalus can damage brain tissues and cause a range of impairments in the brain function. 
according to Husserl, it may cause atrophy of the cerebral cortex and degeneration of the white matter tracts. And the signs of the symptoms of hydrocephalus um, include acute hydrocephalus and a normal pressure hydrocephalus. And acute hydrocephalus presents with the signs of uh, RICP. Uh, according to Husserl, there are four pro progressive stages of RICP. Stage one, there are more, no detectable symptoms. The pressure change can be detected with the ICP monitoring. And stage two, the symptoms are subtle and transient, including episodes of confusion, restlessness, drowsiness, slight pupillary, pu uh, pupil pupillary, uh, and the breathing change. And stage three, it shows decreasing levels of arousal uh, or central new neurogenic hyperventilation, widened pulse pressure, bradycardia, and small sluggish pupils. And stage four, it shows brain her herniation syndrome, such as decreased level of consciousness, even unconscious respiratory abnormality and the pulse rate variation, etc. And normal pressure hydro, uh, hydrocephalus develops slowly. It may have the symptoms as below, declining memory and cognitive function. The triad symptoms uh, of an steady broad-based based, uh, gait with a history of falling. Uh, incontinence and dementia. And here is Susanna is going to tell you more about uh, hydrocephalus. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk regarding diagnostic tests and labs. Uh, neurological exam, uh, the neurologist may ask questions and conduct relatively simple tests in the office to judge muscle conditions, movement, well-being, and how well the senses are functioning. Uh, brain imaging. Imaging tests can help diagnose hydrocephalus and identify underlying causes of the symptoms. Those tests may include ultrasound, computerized tomography, CT scans. CT scans for hydrocephalus are usually used only for emergency exams. Uh, there is also magnetic resonance imaging and MRI scans can show enlarged ventricles caused by excess cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, they may also be used to identify underlying causes of hydrocephalus or other conditions contributing to the symptoms. Uh, actually, there is MRI image of the um, hydrocephalus in the brain. Uh, there is some uh, treatments, uh, physical examination, imaging procedures, uh, surgery to recess uh, um, uh, cysts, neoplasm or hematomas, ventricular bypass into the normal intracranial channel or into an extracranial compartment using a shunt procedure. Excision, excision or coagulation of foid plexus to reduce formation of the CSF or when uh, papilloma is present. Reduction in CSF through diuresis or ventroculoperitoneal shunt placement for normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, there is a, a, another slide uh, which shows ventricular shunt in the uh, child's brain before child place, uh, uh, ch uh, shunt placement and after shunt placement. Uh, now I'm gonna um, ask uh, Alan, uh, Alan Daniel De Leon uh, to continue talk regarding prognosis, treatments, and care plans for the hydrocephalus.
Thank you. Um, so, so we have hydrocephalus as a topic. Um, so like um, Wailing said earlier, um, most commonly, um, sign of si sign and symptoms of um, hydrocephalus is increased um, intracranial pressure. So we have to assess vital signs hourly, um, per facility protocol, um, neurological status, um, head circumference, and fontanelles. So um, signs of ICP is tachycardia, shallow breathing, and changes in blood pressure. Um, so we have to check those and check reflexes and motor functions of the patient um, and head circumference. Um, if there's any increased head circumference, it, that means um, there's accumulating fluid. So we have to assess on that. Um, we have to initiate safety and procedure precautions. We have to keep oxygen and suction at bedside um, because um, in ICP or intracranial pressure can lead to seizure. We have to elevate the head of the bed um, about 30 degrees to promote CSF drainage and breathing. We have to administer medication appropriately like diuretics to control production of um, CSF, um, corticosteroids for inflammation, um, and then we have to encourage frequent bowel movements um, to reduce risk of ICP due to constipation. We have to monitor signs of infection. We have to apply appropriate wound care and to prevent spread of infection and reduce um, any risk of brain injury. Also, um, we have to provide education for patients and parents or caregivers um, with information like this. Um, yep, um, nursing plan of care. So we came up for um, nursing diagnosis. Priority is ineffective cerebral tissue perfusion related to increased intracranial pressure as evidenced by altered level of consciousness. So that's our main priority. Our goal is um, patient will demonstrate improved brain function as evidenced by improved, improvement of orientation and normal vital signs by the end of my shift. Our nursing interventions are to assess vital signs, neurological status, head circumference, um, to see if there's any changes, and to provide quiet and quiet environment and adequate rest periods. And next one would be rest of risk risk for infection related to procedure of shunt insertion. Um, our goal is patient will remain free of infection as evidenced by absence of signs and symptoms of infection. So we had to assess surgical site for any inflammation. Um, we have to assess drainage and dressing, increase WBC levels and increase temperature. And we have to follow a septic technique, um, uh, appropriate hand washing um, when doing procedure as changing of dressing. And our last slides are um, our references. So next slide, please. So these are just um, our references. Um, something we came up to um, when, you know, doing our research. Um, um, so everything is there. Um, so thank you very much for um, listening. Um, myself, I'm Wailing, Justin and Susanna. Um, thank you very much.